timekeeper is in the room. Uh, in the back. We have 40 minutes, 4 0. Yep. Awesome. So we want to do like. Wait, break the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt us. Yeah, um, right. It's not nice to tempt people. So, welcome um, to our talk repurpose purpose using Git Stag for supply chain security. This is Ed. I'm Ava. Hello. So, a couple things, a bit of housekeeping. Both Ava and I really do well with questions as we go in the talk. So if something comes up where you have a question that occurs to you, it's very likely it's occurred to someone else, and it's very productive if you actually answer it. And we find that super fun because it's much more interesting to interact with the audience. For, for you to ask it and us to answer it. And we probably have one that we can say pretty quickly. Absolutely. So second thing, we are probably going to ask you questions in the course of the talk. Now, we're not going to usually ask for verbal answers, although that it could, could happen. happen. There may be a quiz. <laughs> um, but usually we will ask you to raise your hand, just to get a sense for where all of you are as an audience, because that impacts what we choose to present. Yep. So both of us have a scientific background. And so what do good scientists do in this situation? Occasionally make physics jokes. Yes, that too. <laughs> um, we, 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 we test our theory. Why? Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We calibrate. So, quick calibration. How many of you can raise your hand? You are an excellent audience. We usually only get about 80 or 90% for that one. Nice. Um, it's really tragic that the incapability of hand raising that happens. So, a little bit of history from, a um, little bit of history first. So, how many of you remember the colonial pipeline hack? Awesome. Good with the hand raising. Um, now, when that happened, you wound up with the cybersecurity executive order for the Biden administration. That also familiar to folks? Fabulous. So, for a lot of people, that's where supply chain, SBOMs first bubbled up to their consciousness. But there's been a lot that's been going on for a long time, right? So, for example, SPDX, which provides an SBOM format, goes all the way back to February of 2010. And they've been diligently working in this problem space since. 2008 is where this problem landed on my lap at Cisco, and where I had built out an industrialized SBOM process, meaning tens of thousands of software releases shipping every year, for which we had to have the complete notion of what was in them, both for open source license compliance and also for third party security. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mistakes were made. There's no question about that. Anytime you move into a new field that early in it, you're going to make mistakes. And that was absolutely something that happened there. But in the process, I learned a hell of a lot about the available error space, which is always important because if you remember the mistakes that have been made, you can try and avoid them in the future. <clears throat> which sort of flashes us forward to this colonial pipeline hack situation. So again, that was May of 2021. Very quickly, you got the cybersecurity executive order. And then about that time, a whole bunch of friends of mine in the SPDX community, which I hadn't really been participating in for about a decade at that point, reached out and said, you remember some of your crazier ideas? Now may be the time. And so in late May, there was a, the first Git Bomb talk occurred and presented the crazy idea that you're going to hear today. It went well. People liked it. And so after a whole lot of background conversations with many, many people in sort of what I would ca call the pseudo public, meaning that every, all the slides were available, everyone knew what was going on, but we hadn't really formed a community. Yeah, we didn't really and, announce it. Yeah, there was, there, no. Yeah. So in, in February of 2022, we, we figured, okay, we've got a website up finally. We finally went and got a Twitter account. We should probably announce a public community, start holding regular community <laughs> meetings, and start actually working on a spec and a bunch of proofs of concepts and things, and that went well. As, as everyone <laughs> knows, you can't, do it, you can't call it public or even really work until it's on Twitter. That's true. It's not real. Um, <laughs> So in the first couple of weeks, we got about 82,000 impressions. We had 
about 19,000 people who went by and visited the profile. We had, you know, 5,500, 5.6 thousand people visit the website from all over the world. Like, it was a pretty successful launch for a Twitter account that had never tweeted before. Um, of a tiny open source project that didn't really have much yet besides a draft of a spec and some words we copied out of the spec. And a white paper. And a white paper. A really nice well, white paper. Uh, uh, yep. So again, that went well. Let's see if this clicker works. <laughs> can I go back? Yes, I can. I can go forward. Wow. Ooh. OK, so, so this is where I step in the picture. Um, gosh, we can't see that. It's Baby Yoda. It's Baby Yoda <laughs> sipping some tea. Um, because I stepped into the supply chain space completely new to supply chains. Um, I've been working in open source for a long time, 20 some years. Everything from hardware security and firmware to cloud infrastructure to databases to other things. Uh, but had not really focused on supply chains, didn't know SPDX from CycloMDX when I started. I'm like, great, I have a, a, a new thing to learn. I'm going to try taking a beginner's approach to it and just learn from everybody else. And I spent about six months going from community to community, reading docs, talking to people, finding out what's going on here. And it looked like that. Is this what it looked like to everyone else as well? I mean, not, not the disappearing screen. Is this what it looked like to everyone else? <laughs> so how many of you saw it this way when you first started looking at supply chain security? In open source, yeah. Um, even as someone who's been everywhere from Linux kernel to hypervisors on up, I could trace a supply chain in one community or for one project, but thinking of the whole domain, I didn't have an answer. No one that I spoke to had an answer either. Um, this picture probably won't come through either. It's Baby Yoda looking very overwhelmed, the like, oh, face. Um, this deck is going to be a little bit more challenging with bad contrast. Hmm. So anyway, uh, well, if you feel like the Baby Yoda here going, oh, you're not alone even today. A lot of folks are still really overwhelmed by the, the, the number of different tools trying to fill the space and not seeing how they all fit together. So let's try and simplify that. Um, what everyone wants to know is, am I safe? Underneath all of the tools and the technology, we all want to know, can I use <clears throat> this piece of software? Does it contain a vulnerability? Does it contain malicious code? What happens with its next update? So. Um, I've been around long enough to become slightly opinionated about the world. And one of the things that I learned the hard way, because I have the sort of mind that thrives on abstraction, and the world becomes very complicated. And so having made, again, many mistakes, one of the things I've learned is you want to focus on simplicity. Because simple things are reliable. They work. Simple things are performant. And simple things are secure. But the problem is that humans tend to want to make things very complex. And, and in particular, some problems are complex, but often we make problems more complex by how we choose to think about them. So just take a really simple example of what I mean here. If I have this linear picture that probably looks familiar to all of us from middle school, and I've got a bunch of points that I look at and say, ah, the model is complex enough. I need two parameters to describe every one of the points here, because they've got some place in x and some place in y. But that's actually not the complexity of the system here we're looking at. We've made it that complex. If you just tilt your head to the side a little bit, you realize how simple it is. You can often simplify a problem space by making a perspective change. And so, you know, very often, that's a productive way to approach these things. So when I look at the supply chain problem space from the perspective of building open source software communities and providing the stewardship for them over time, three things stood out. What is this software artifact? Is it a piece of source code? Is it a binary someone else gave me? Is it a Docker image? That is the identity of the software is a thing that we have to be able to see and understand and, and represent. What are its dependencies? What's in it? And what metadata is associated with it? What else do we know about the software? This is really everything else that isn't its identity or its dependency graph. So 
I'll dive into these for, for a few minutes. This, these are my slides, I think. Of course. Yeah. Um, an artifact, in our terminology here, is really any software object of interest. Could be, I don't know if you can see the tiny little writing there in dim gray, source code file, object file, uh, .so, shared object file, uh, .dll on Windows. It could be a jar file, a class file, a .deb, a .rpm package. They all have one thing in common. Software artifacts can be represented as an array of bytes, because that's how they're stored on disk. And so any two artifacts are equivalent if and only if the byte array representations of them are equivalent. Based on this, it should be possible to represent each one with a unique ID. And that ID should have this, the following three characteristics. This, I think, is sort of the, the, one of the hearts of Gitbomb. The ID needs to be canonical, that any two independent parties can derive the same identity when presented with equivalent artifacts. It needs to be unique, right? Non-equivalent artifacts have a different ID. And immutable. If you change the artifact, you inherently change the ID as well. A bunch of things that are talked about today are not identity. The file name. I can move a file between directories, it's still the same file. I can change the content in the file, but keep the name the same, and it's a different file. So file name and location doesn't work. Same is true for URLs. If I fetch it from, from the website, I fetch something from that URL tomorrow, or if you fetch it from a different IP address in a different country, you de get different content. URL of Perl, yep, that's what I just meant. Uh, and then the, sorry, Alan, this one's at you. Uh, <laughs> minimum elements of an SBOM. Um, the, the Linux kernel gets built by a lot of companies. If I build one and Ed builds one, and we tell you these are both v5.17.3, um, but we might call it something different. I call it the Linux kernel, and Ed calls it the kernel. They're from different suppliers. Do you know if the same files were used, the same source code files? You don't. There's about 50,000 files in the kernel tree. Any given build probably uses about 3,000 of those files, but you don't know which ones when someone gives you a binary. You have no way of knowing that today. And that's sort of the fundamental problem here. So, along with simplicity, I've also learned not to reinvent the wheel. Especially don't reinvent the wheel, only this time triangular, because you have strong stability requirements. This identity problem is already actually solved very nicely for source code by Git. So how many of you use Git? How many of you understand Git? <laughs> how many ah, of you, how the humor is you, strong in this room. <laughs> how many of you understand the Merkle tree underneath Git? Ah, good. excellent. Okay, okay, good, so, good. So you eat a lot of this. So basically, for those of who are, you who are less familiar, Git is actually assigns a Git object ID to every file that you check in. Mm -hmm. So if source code files are artifacts, for source code files, we have an identity for them that while it's not used for every source code file in the universe, it's used for the vast majority of them. So most of these things were already identified and indexed as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Um, and it's very, very simple. The git object DD across the contents, which are just the byte array of the file, gives you a 20 byte hash that you can go and find and see exactly what the identity is that I use in my local repo, that's used up on GitHub, that's used today, that's used a thousand years from now. It doesn't change. We're going to have to speed up a tiny bit. Sure. Oh, sorry. So, I think it's you, but I can do anyway, it. No, no, no. no. Okay. Anyway, yeah. so effectively, <laughs> Git is not actually really a source code management system. Git is actually an object store that uses Merkle trees masquerading as a source code management system. And so what that really means is a Merkle tree is just something where you've captured all the leaf nodes with an identity that's unique, immutable, and um, canonical. canonical. And every non-leaf node gathers together its children in such a way that you can't misrepresent that. And this is one of the powerful things about Git because it allows you to actually, if I give you an ID for a commit or a tree in Git, 
I can't give you something that doesn't match it and get away with it. You can, super you can verify all of the descendants, all of the dependencies in that graph. Yeah. Which is, which is why, by the way, Git is both, history in Git is both ephemeral and immutable yeah. at the same time. It's lovely. And so we maintain, and this is sort of one of the fundamental things that Gitbomb maintains, and this is why Gitbomb is Gitbomb, is that your best bet is to use Gitoids as your identifier for software artifacts. They're a suitable identifier, and they happen to be an extremely powerful identifier because the vast majority of things that matter are already indexed this way. Which brings us around to dependencies. So when you look at what went into this artifact, the dependency graph of the artifact, so here's a really simple example. You've got a bunch of source code. Something transforms that source code, in, a in the case of C, a compiler, into the odd object files. Then some linker links them together into an executable. You could then think about a running executable, something running on your software, on your system. And in the case of C, it's very often true that you need to know not just the executable that you're running, but you also need to know what SOs with their attendant trees were linked into it, because otherwise you could have a vulnerability that sneaks in that is not a vulnerability of your executable, but is a vulnerability in combination with that shared object. Now this works all across all languages. Java, you compile Java files to classes, you load them with class loaders into running executables. And so you might look at this and say, what if we just generalize? And this is what Gitbomb suggests is, whatever language you're using, whatever the artifacts you're dealing with, generalize this and start talking about the artifact dependency graph. Now this is a directed acyclic graph. We will sometimes improperly call it a tree, but just a graph. And then use Gitoids as the artifact IDs in this graph. Very simple. Every language has libraries in Git that can compute the Gitoid. And if you don't have one, it takes about 15 minutes to write one in most languages that I've tried. Super easy. Now, then you might say, okay, well, how do we capture the graphiness of it, right? We've identified the nodes in the graph. How do we capture the relationships? And so what Gitbomb suggests is for each artifact that has some inputs to it, we simply capture what we call the Gitbomb document that expresses the relationship. Now, in the case of artifact two and three, they only have leaf nodes as children, so that looks like blob space and the Gitoid of artifact four, new line terminated record, blob space, the Gitoid of artifact five, new line terminated record. You put them in lexical order, so again, they're canonical. Everyone gets the same one every time. And you, the same for artifact three. And then for artifact one, and this is the Merkle tree-ness of it all, you simply start the same way, but because artifact two and three both have children, you include a stanza for the git object ID of their git bomb document, which means that you've captured the Merkle tree in the course of this. And this is, by the way. Sorry, what? Mm, no, the, the projector did that last. There, there we, we go. go. Yeah, this is, by the way, the same, um, almost the same very heavily inspired by the file system structure of Git. It's not precisely the same because Git does care about things like file modes that aren't yeah. interesting to us. Yeah. But it's heavily inspired by Git. So, metadata, the third factor here is what else is known about it. I'll quote one of our colleagues um, that an SBOM is just a format for organizing metadata that describes the makeup of a thing. It's really everything else you know about it. So looking back at that graph, one might say that any artifact can have metadata associated with it. A source code file could have a license associated with it. A binary could have um, a supplier or a contract terms or a price or a CVE. Those are all things that can be and are represented in SBOMs today. And so we've been working with the SBOM communities like SPDX to create a way to interrelate these. Gitbomb is not an SBOM, it complements them. So if you have an SBOM document, you can, as of SPDX 2.3, the current draft, it's been approved and merged, waiting for them to issue the, the new spec update, uh, you'll be able to reference a Gitbomb document directly from your SPDX document and say, this artifact has all this extra information and it's that one by using the Gitoid. 
So you can think of these as two different domains in however you're tracking this in your, your <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, what was I gonna say on this one? I think I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running ahead of myself on the slide, sorry about that. So if this is what is known about a piece of software, you might ask yourself, how is it known? And how can you trust that knowledge? Have you ever thought about, let's see a show of hands here, have you ever thought about how do you know the things you know with software? Not that many hands. So, so all of you who didn't put your hand up, if I just give you a binary and I tell you what's in it, are you gonna run it? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're a curmudgeon, it doesn't count. <laughs> um, if I give you a piece of software and it's signed, are you just gonna run it because it's signed? Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and yet a lot of people are focused on that as the answer right now, right? A signature is only as good as the chain of trust in the signature chain. It could still be compromised beforehand. All that the, si the signing of the software has done is prove to you when you verify it that it hasn't been changed since it was signed. If you then verify the signature through some other channel, you might also know who signed it, but not what they signed, or that what's in it is the thing you think it is. Which kind of gets down to this question of what is trust itself? Um, what is trust in computing? It turns out this is a really complex question. Um, I'm gonna touch on it a little bit. I actually edited a book last year that was just published called Trust in Computer Systems in the Cloud. If you want to go down the rabbit hole of contemplating how do we trust our devices and how do we trust each other through our devices? What does it even mean to say I trust my computer when I type in the password or I go pay a bill? Who am I trusting when I trust my computer and my bank's systems? It's a fun book, it's like this thick, it's super dry, don't read it, I mean please do, it's, it's good. Um, I don't make any money from it. <laughs> um, there's no answer, there's no easy answer, answer to this. Going back to the 90s, um, Dorothy Denning, uh, said this in refutation of what was then the, the, the prevailing wisdom from a government-issued book called The Little Orange Book um, that said that a, that the Orange Book said that a computer system could be built in such a way as to make it arbitrarily trustworthy. And Dorothy Denning said, no, that's, that's not true. Trust is not a property in a thing. It's an assessment of the thing based on experience made by some observer at some point in time in some context. It might be trustworthy here, but the same device is not trustworthy running in space. It might be trustworthy for my bank, but not for some other function. Um, and so whether it's an SBOM or a uh, binary scanning tool that you use as you're ingesting software or downloading a package from the internet, these are our mechanisms to either look at someone else's declaration that they trusted it, or decide for yourself that you want to trust it. By combining them, maybe we get a little bit more of a sense of trust. But trust is always time-dependent, asymmetrical, and contextual. And that's sort of the hypothesis, or the, the, the main thesis, rather, of, of the book um, last year. <clears throat> Just because you trusted a piece of software I gave you today, does that mean you should trust it a year from now? <laughs> well, it's it's um, good that no one thinks so. <laughs> yeah. um, if, I, if you give me a piece of software and I choose to trust it, does that mean you should trust software I'm gonna give you back in return? No, it's asymmetrical. And same thing again, it's contextual. So, build tools, oh, build tools, that's you. Yes, indeed. So, context is a really interesting part of trust. Um, and so when you look at build tools, part of the problem that you have with build tools is that build tools transform their inputs. And they transform their inputs in fundamentally destructive ways, meaning you're losing information in the course of compiling your software. Um, and so, you know, when you look at this, you're like, okay, so the build tools transform their input, so how do we actually figure out what happened there? So you could try scanning the input. And that will tell you that it contains apples and cinnamon and flour and eggs and, and other apples. Um, so 
this would be sort of scanning the inputs on the disk. So if you, how many of you build code? How many of you ever built a piece of code where not every file in your repo gets built into it? This should be all of your hands, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing what's actually there as a potential input, or even what's an you know, actual input, doesn't explain the output. No, we haven't. We'll, <laughs> we'll so get there. You're a great street man, but give us a second. <laughs> so what about post hoc scanning? Surely this will save us. Take your output, point a scanner at it. So we're going to turn the entire audience into a scanning tool. What kind of pie is that? Just shout it out. Shout it out. So we have a Play-Doh pie. We have a. Okay. We have, this is not a pie. Are you a Taoist, sir? <laughs> I, it's the image of a pie. Good, good, good. Uh -huh. Other other ideas about what kind of pie it is is these scanning tools. Pumpkin, blueberry. So yep. now you understand the, the plight of the poor person trying to run scanning tools on the output. Even even if you you know take a little cut of the pie and look inside and go, oh, I see apple slices. But if someone has, let's say, uh, a peach allergy or strawberry allergy, are you sure you want to eat it without asking first? Yeah, could be a peach pie. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Again, curmudgeon. Um, so <coughs> post hoc scanning, while if there's nothing else available to you, can be somewhat helpful, it literally can't tell you what's in the pie. Hmm. We just demonstrated that with an example in the audience. And, and I think everybody's realized this. Like being, post hoc scanning has been going on for at least 15 years in my experience, and, and it's always been an acknowledged limitation. So if we can't trust pre hoc scanning and we can't trust post hoc scanning to be perfect, they'll get us some things, but not all the way there. Um, I think we got our yep. so, things backwards. So. Yep. Next one might be. Well, so, yeah, so tools, basically, yeah. what can you trust? The answer is you can trust the build tools. They're the thing. Give well. me a second. <laughs> the build tools are the things that built it. So if I'm the build tool, I opened the bloody files that went into the thing. Now, maybe I'm going to lie to you. That could happen. But generally speaking, the build tools or are at least in a position to know the answer. Maybe something else attaches to them and injects things into them. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> you can go down the rabbit hole very far if you need to. Um, but effectively, of the available choices, the build tools are really your best choice for the question, what to trust about providing me sort of the canonical information about the inputs along the way. And please note, when I say build tools, I don't mean build orchestrators, things like make. I mean or actual build, good. We also don't mean things like Jenkins. The, oh, act, the, the CI system that's running the build process, that is not what we mean. What I mean here is things like GCC, LLVM, your linker, or the, you know, the Rust compiler, the Go compiler, uh, the Python runtime itself, since it, it, it compiles as it loads um, dynamically. Or if you're putting a container together, like that build Docker build may actually be Docker build. Yep. But these are actually the pieces that at least in principle could be trusted. Because, because they, they have the right context. They're in the right context at the right time. Yep. And so we finally reach Gitbomb. It is a minimalistic scheme for build tools, for following what we mean by build tools here, to provide a, or to build a compact artifact dependency graph. By the way, I'm pretty proud that I, I used, I reused um, DAG from Git um, to create an ADG that tracks every source code file incorporated into each artifact built along the entire supply chain to embed an ID for that artifact dependency graph itself in the artifact that is built by it. And to do this in a way that is language independent, it can work in a language heterogeneous environment like open source is at scale. Across packaging formats, most importantly with zero developer effort. One of the biggest challenges here is getting this adopted by open source projects, 99% of which have roughly one developer and no budget. So doing this in a way that can um, enable artifact resolution across packaging and languages um, that are all volunteer run and don't have budgets. That's our goal. So people can answer the question, am I safe? So let's fast forward, imagine we have this. It's been integrated into the open source build tools. 
that everyone's using five years from now, and you get a Docker image, and it has a fingerprint, and you can look up somewhere in a public location that fingerprint and see the whole artifact dependency graph. You, you can pull its SBOM, you have the git bomb tree for it. When the next log4j happens, it's buried down there in some source file in red that you probably can't see on the slide, sorry. Um, but you can identify it because the fingerprint is there in the tree. And so the, the value proposition that I believe we are really enabling is for the blue teams, for the incident response teams of the world who are consuming open source packages today built by other people, they download them, they do a basic scan on them, load them into, into their internal mirror, this gives them additional signal to be able to identify ones that have discovered vulnerabilities in between the time, of course, that it was built, staged, launched in production. The additional signal resolution here enables those teams who are often under high stress, short deadlines, low budgets, to find the issues faster and remediate them better. With, again, no imposed cost on the broad community, just a cost on a few, you know, a couple tens of uh, large projects like the build tools out there. I see a hand popping up. Ah, mm. I did skip that step. Very astute. Well, so so here's the trick. So let, let's take for example. Hmm? Yeah, so take for example log 4 j If I remember correctly, there's a small number of versions of JD and I Realm Java or something in log 4 j that are actually the source of the vulnerability. Now, in the magical five year of the future world, it becomes extremely valuable to report those Gitoids with the CVE, right? So that's sort of the longer term answer is, report them because they're a higher precision report of a vulnerability. Not in place of, but in addition to. In addition to any other information we have. Right. It's sort of like when we were talking about um, <coughs> SBOMs being a description of things. If I give you the GPS coordinates of my house, it's also useful for me to tell you that it's a yellow house with blue trim. Right, so in the CV report, I want to tell you the GPS coordinates of the vulnerability in source code, and also tell you that it's this package, this versions, et cetera. Now, as we're getting from A to B, there's a bunch of places in, uh, there are a bunch of tooling that's being done as proof of concept work in the GitBomb community, where folks have tools that can be pointed at the Git repo for log4j and spit out those Gitoids for you. So the mechanisms of discovering those Gitoids, even from where we are exactly now, is fairly straightforward. Not perfectly, but enough to be extraordinarily useful. And I think part of your question was the correlation. Who publishes that correlation? Well, when we know there's a CVE, and it came from these JDNI files, or it came from this version of, I don't know, OpenSSL.h, that can, like, that file has a Gitoid, whether it is MITRE or some company that then publishes the correlation, doesn't matter to us. It can be done by anybody. Um, it, you could stick it in, the, in that project in some way. I probably want to centralize it somewhere, or at least in a couple places. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Well, we have the same thing today, so I'll repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you trace down a vulnerability to a particular function, and you realize that that function was in the, the, known, the now known bad state for multiple file versions and multiple releases of the package, 
how then do you do the correlation? The same way we, we, we do with the CVE, where it says, oh, this CVE exists in version x.1, x.2, x.3. It's in this range. We just use, we just add gitoids and say it also exists in these gitoids. And Got it? Okay, cool. No, but it's actually a good question, right? Because it's not going to be obvious to everyone. But yeah. for example, how many of you have ever written git log on a, git log and a file name? Oh, goodness. <laughs> right? Git log and a file name. Because you could actually ask git, and it's the blink of an eye to know the log information for a particular file mm -hmm. in git. Yeah. Cool. So, other questions? More questions, questions. yeah. Awesome. We're, we're, really questions. The last slide here is just, hey, here's some links to come learn more about the, the POC. So we'll stay here and bring on the questions. Uh, I see a hand, I see, I think, David's hand, and then you, and then you. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I'll repeat, I'll repeat the question. Um, how does Gitbomb intersect with the reproducible builds effort? Um, what David didn't ask is, do we need reproducible builds for Gitbomb to work? And what David did ask is, if we use Gitbomb by embedding the Gitoid of the build tree itself, do we prevent reproducible builds from being reproducible in environments where there's a not, there is no other functional change or difference in the resulting artifact, but some non-functional header files um, got read in, resulting in a different uh, gitoid embedded in it, thus making it not reproducible? Um, we're thinking about both of these. I don't have a good answer yet. Yeah, well, so, I mean, and the, part of the thing, the thinking process, and please note, this is not an answer, because as David mentioned, this is ongoing dialogue. Yep. is part of it, and I've sort of been whining in my head how you attack the problem, is how do you define the reproducibility of a build, right? And one way it, to say that a build is reproducible is to say if I give you a set of inputs, I will always get exactly the same output. And it happens, and, and then you get into the question of equivalence of the output. So you may have noticed we made a very specific choice about artifact equivalence. And that choice was the byte arrays are the same. Now, this is not the only available choice for equivalence. Mm -hmm. But as far as we can tell, it's the only one you can reliably do in the generic. Because different languages will have entirely different behaviors around how all, all these semantics work out. And it's also one that's extremely simple. I will throw a wrench in our own works. OK. Um, byte obfuscation techniques can result in functionally identical binaries with different byte structures. And this is a lovely way for malware to sneak past scanners. Mm -hmm. um, no, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it in this space as well. No, but yes. Well, we have we had a couple other hands come up, and we had a few other hands come up, David. And there's only like two minutes left. Debating, debatable, discussable. Um, I believe your hand was up, and then I saw a hand back there if we have time. And I think I may have missed it, but what happens when you go down the dependency tree and potentially hit a project that isn't going to get, especially the, if you're talking about... Doesn't matter. We, we, don't, we don't depend on so git. We're just using the, the git hash function, the gitoid function as the identifier. It could be stored anywhere. So we, we use the gitoid hash function and we draw tremendous inspiration from Git, yeah. right? Um, and we advocate actually for using the Gitoid hash function in a lot of places. A lot of folks we talk to about interoperability of Gitoid with other things in the ecosystem, 
the answer really comes down to, hey, if you'll store the getoid of the thing, then we're done. We've got interoperability. Doesn't matter, do doesn't matter what version control system you use. Mm -hmm. I think, yep. So, um, the scheme that you're looking at, do you think that it seems like it would be equally sensible enough to store other metadata? Mm. So S bombs yeah, do that well. Let me let me actually let me let me okay. sort of repeat the question first because this is a yep, brilliant yep, question yep. and one we just didn't have time in this presentation for. So I would love to talk to anybody yep. and everybody, and but especially spent you afterwards. Months debating and discussing right. this point. So it's effectively, a really good question. The um, the question was, what if there's other metadata that I care about that I'd like to know, and in particular, what if there's other metadata the build tool knows that I would like mm -hmm. to know about, and the fundamental thing from our perspective is we've actually talked about it's perfectly fine for your build tool to write out other metadata into, we usually talk about putting it in a metadata directory, right? Or build info or debug info, whatever or you call incredible it. Incredible numbers of things that people are yep. interested in. And the way you connect them is the metadata points into the artifact tree. So yep. if I wanted, as a very simple case that almost every build tool wants immediately is, I'd actually really like to know as a matter of metadata, the file name and how it associates to the getaway of the artifact. So when I'm debugging what the hell just happened, I can see what's going on. Now, you don't want to put that in the artifact tree for all the reasons we talked about, about how it's essentially ephemeral data to the artifact dependency graph. But it's super useful for users, and it may also be too detailed to get into your SBOM, but you can have that metadata generated out as part of your build. You can pick it up and use it. You can be generated by your build tools. Um, and and in the there's same, a rich discussion in this space in the community. I think that in the same way that the SPDX community now is using Gitoid as an artifact uh, external reference ID, build tools could do the same, and then you'd also have compatibility between different build tools for their debug in, info or debug symbol files if they all referenced into the, the uh, artifact dependency graph in the same way. I think we're at time. So Thank we, you all so much. We're definitely at time. I know I am, and I, think, I suspect that Ava is as well. We can wander out into the hallway yep. and find some place for folks who want to talk. Yep. Also, find us at any point you know, subsequently. Um, we're very friendly, um, and we'd be delighted to talk about this stuff, because the more eyeballs we get on this, the better. Thank you. <laughs>